Hello everybody, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing this study of the book of Acts, and I think this is our 10th um, episode so far. Um, we are now on chapter 8, and today we'll pick up with uh, verse 14. Now, if you did not see all the previous studies on the book of Acts, I hope you will go back and watch it all from the beginning. We've we've covered a lot of important ground. Some really exciting stuff is coming up very soon too. So I'm <laughs> this is as I said before I started this, I was very very excited about doing this study. So please um, thank you if you're going to watch this video. Great, but I hope you will take the time to watch it in its entirety. Start with the first one. Uh, before we get going, let's uh, ask uh, Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi. And I think. Um, what should we do, Joe? Should we put the pressure on Ted to, to be the first responder today? I think the pressure should always go to Ted as the first responder. All right, Ted, you get to go first today. This must be one of those youth before beauty type of things, okay? So we can do that. Uh, this is Ted, and uh, my channel is God's Truth Ministries. I've got some few videos on there for uh, getting the gospel out and uh, edifying the saints, and I'm looking forward to this study as, as we go forward here in Acts. Thanks, brother. All right. Okay, thank you. And uh, Brother Joe. Uh, this is Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel, and uh, my channel is for fellowship and learning. Uh, and as I've been saying for three days now, and I, I like saying it, uh, I'm not to be held as accountable as the two who have ministries and uh, do teaching. So uh, anything uh, said that's out of line, uh, please hold them to a much higher standard than you do me. Back to you. <laughs> okay. All right, now the pressure's really on me now, I guess. And, and Teddy's put the pressure on you, too. He's elevated us to, to the authorities. I, I'm not claiming to be an authority either, but uh, um, there, are, there are some parts of the scriptures that I say I don't understand it at all. And there's other parts where... I say I, I have a, an opinion, but I'm not that I'm not that sure. And then there's other parts where I'm so convinced I'm just uh, just uh, I'm absolutely 100% certain that I couldn't possibly be wrong on this. So that's that's my attitude. Um, all right, uh, let's get get going. Uh, chapter eight, verse 14 in the KJV first. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, uh, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, they Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. All right, Brother Ted, you go first. Well, uh, this is just, uh, you know, first of all, the, we're glad, and they're, they're, they're glad, of course, that uh, the people of Samaria, the, pe the saints at Jerusalem, the apostles, had, were certainly glad that uh, the Samaritans received the message. I mean, even if there were mixed feelings of any resentment or, uh, you know, so-called racial hostilities that uh, they indeed certainly had a tendency to have towards people of Samaria, uh, they were glad that these people received the word of God um, from uh, Philip. And, uh, you know, so they went down there. I think pro probably we can read in between the lines that they went down there to ch check out just how how genuine this was and, you know, what was up, you might say, in the vernacular. But uh, <clears throat> so Peter and John go, and verse 15 and 16 just show me right there that... Uh, Things aren't uh, today like that. Things uh, today, when a person believes, they receive the Holy Spirit uh, upon belief, faith in Christ. Uh, this was certainly a, a transition period, uh, even though it was all according to prophecy. But the authority the apostles had is something we don't have today. Just because we're saved nowadays, we don't have the ability to lay hands on somebody and they receive the Holy Spirit. Of course, they don't have to have us now. So uh, this is certainly different. That's why 
Uh, I've talked to people, and, I, and I, I've heard this, and I say this too, that you can't take Acts uh, in every place, certainly, uh, as a doctrinal book. We can take it as, as places to you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, but we can't take it for doctrinal and, and practice uh, you know, set in stone. You know, We don't have communal living now. We don't lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit, things like that. Our shadow doesn't pass uh, by sick people and they get well. Uh, so things are different. Things are different now, and we'll, we'll see that more as we go through Acts. Uh, but I'll stop and go back to you, brother. All right. Very good. Uh, brother Joe, what do you say? You say? Well, I, I was uh, – Ted actually uh, helped clear things up for me a little bit there. Uh, I've always been perplexed by this uh, portion of Scripture. Uh, and, of course, the Pentecostals use this as, like Ted was saying, doctrine uh, inappropriately where, you know, you need your the hands laid on you to receive the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, there's some manifestation uh, uh, showing that you've received the Holy Spirit in many cases. And then they break uh, the Holy Spirit uh, into two different kind of indwelling. There's the, you know, everyone gets the Holy Spirit when they're saved. And then, of course, there's the special uh, people who get a special anointing for special purposes. And uh, I would I would disagree with all of that also, just like Ted did. But I still am a little perplexed uh, regarding why uh, they had to wait for the apostles to come. Uh, reflecting back on the book so far, this is the first time uh, that the Jews have reached out to Gentiles, and I, the Sumerians are, you know, uh, half Jew, half Gentile and they do uh, have, a, have a form of Judaism, but it's kind of funny how they're, you know, taking one step at a time towards the Gentiles. This is the first step away from pure Judaism. So uh, uh, I don't understand why they had to wait for the apostles, uh, and I don't think it really explains that. So uh, I'll just have to put it in the, that's interesting file, uh, something to be answered sometime, but uh, not now. Back to you, Luke. Wow, well, okay, there's a, uh, I'm hoping, since I haven't really read ahead and uh, um, sometimes we're encountering something and it's, it's a surprise for me I, and I, I don't, I, I'm hoping that the following verses will give us more information and so I'll have a better answer, but at this point I, uh, I think one thing that's important to understand uh, and this goes back to the first video in this series when I gave an introduction to the book. And it's important when we when we study any book of the Bible, there's a lot of things that uh, I said in the introduction that are, are really are relevant. They're not just a you know a formality. Just well, these are the in introducing the book. But why do why do all these things in the introduction have any relevance? Well, we, we need to understand who wrote the book, a little bit about that person, what was their purpose in writing the book, who were they writing the book to, um, what's the main point of the theme of the book, um, and all those things can then give us the proper context as we go, go through it. So it's, it is important to, to understand, as Brother Tent said, um, the book of Acts is not where we go to learn the doctrines, uh, even though there is a, uh, the doctrine of salvation by believing on Jesus uh, in, in the book, and uh, the, you can get saved by reading the book of Acts. But that's not the purpose, as it says, and John said, and I think it was chapter 20, verse 21, I think uh, he says, uh, he says, I'm writing these things for, for this purpose so that you can learn how to be saved. I paraphrased it. Uh, but he says the purpose of the book is to t tell you how to be saved by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, your, your Savior. Um, and, and so the, what is the purpose of the book of Acts? It's, it's, it's a, a histor historical book. It, it, he is con Luke. The author is renowned as a historian today. Back then, they probably just considered him to be a physician, an apostle, uh, and, uh, and a, a, an associate of uh, mainly Paul. Uh, 
uh, and and that he but he was very conscientious about recording the history uh, going back to uh, the ascension of Jesus from the ascension of Jesus all the way through until about 60 AD when the book was written that 30 years is covered here and it's so it's a 30 year history of, of the beginnings of the church so that's the point of it to tell us the beginnings of the church and from it we primarily learn that how the church went through a transition from one a realizing that this uh, faith is not just for the Jews but for the whole world Gentiles are included and two that um, Judaism is not part of this new thing uh, you don't have to uh, be a Jew to get saved and once you're saved you don't have to become a Jew and practice Judaism in fact uh, Judaism is uh, it should be actually discarded this is covered more thoroughly in Galatians and, and, and uh, Hebrews but that's that's important to understand if we realize that this book tells us a, a historical record of the transition that the church went through through the first, first 30 years now getting getting back to what something brother Joe said Again, um, now technically, I, I'm, I'm not even sure tec technically that uh, I'm going to uh, disagree with you when you use the word Gentile. See, the word, the word Gentile means non-Jew. Anybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile. Uh, however, when Jews and Gentiles marry and produce offspring, their offspring were called Samaritans, the result of uh, you know, inter, intermarrying between Jews and non-Jews. Uh, so, even though they are, they have their own specific narrow category. Uh, I'm not sure if it's proper or not to call them Gentiles because they do have this this unique um, this unique niche that they're in. They're not Gent Jews. They're not Gentiles. They're Samaritans, and yet we commonly define uh, a Gentiles as anybody that's not a Jew. So that's the situation there. But it's important to understand that even though they're call, called Samaritans, not, not because of their faith and their belief system, but because of their genealogy, uh, because the Jewish families and Gentile families intermarry. That, that's why they're Samaritans. Yeah, but many I don't want to say all, but probably most of these Samaritans held to Judaism. So they were Jews by faith, but not Jews by genealogy. So that's what's important to understand. And the reason I'm making this distinction is that if we compare this initial reaction uh, here to, uh, let me see, let me read it so we get it exactly, exactly right. It says, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, and um, uh, there is no outrage. Um, uh, there, I, I, right there, I don't see any applause. Um, I, I don't see any great joy that, oh, the Samaritans are included, but there's no outrage. However, when we, when we see that the the Gentiles are, uh, got saved. The very first case of it, when Peter preached to Cornelius and his family, their first reaction was outrage with Peter. And so there's a totally different re reaction. And, and so I'm thinking maybe it's because the Samaritans, uh, even though they were not Jewish by birth, they were Jewish by faith. Uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, at the well with Jesus you know, uh, we understand that she believed correctly about uh, in ju her Judaism. She expressed it, her faith in this promised one, this Messiah. And uh, I don't know if they practiced, if they went to the temple and they did the temple worship and the animal sacrifices. I don't know if they pr practiced it completely, the Judaism. I think they probably did. Um, but that's the important thing. To understand, I would not refer to this as, as you did, Brother Joe, as the beginnings of Gentiles um, uh, being saved. Um, 
for that for the reasons I just stated, because I think they were Jews by faith, even though they were Samaritans by genealogy. So I, I hope I didn't. Uh, now regarding the laying on of hands and to receive the Holy Spirit, that's something I don't have an answer for. It seems like a real unique, unusual situation that is not not common, not the way today. Uh, I don't know if there's any. I don't think there's any other examples before or after that are like it, so it seems to be a unique situation. Uh, and maybe as we continue on reading in this part, we'll, we'll be, understand it better. But I'd like to get both of your thoughts on what I just said, though. Uh, go ahead, Brother Joe. Well, I, I, uh, I will counter with a couple points. Number one, I, what you said is not incorrect. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, Christ uh, did mention that to the woman of the well, that they believed uh, in worshiping God at a certain mountain rather than the temple. So that was a difference. Uh, under Mosaic law, the only ones that would have been uh, Jews were the ones born through the female line. So if there was a, uh, a mother that was not Jewish that had children, of course, they would not be considered of the Jewish lineage. Uh, so I, I suspect about half the people there would be rejected. As, uh, as genetically Jewish. And thirdly, uh, Simon seemed to have, Simon the sorcerer, seemed to be in the occult and foreign from uh, the God of Judaism. And he was regarded highly by the leadership and most of the people of Samaria. So taking those three things into account, uh, I would say that they could be considered the first Gentile uh, converts at least in part, so uh, maybe that has something to do with it. Back to you, Luke, or Ken. Yeah. Well, those are good, 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 real interesting points you made here. I, I, what, I, I intended to call on Ted first. I just actually, Joe's name slipped out instead of Ted's, but, but let me just respond further to your comment, uh, Joe. Um, uh, the, um, how do you, do you have any idea about the, the reaction? Because the reaction with Cornelius is they're outraged. They're angry with Peter. Uh, and in this case, there's no expression of any outrage over these Samaritans. Do you have any idea about that? Yeah, I do. Uh, there's a heavy Judaism influence. And, and, and like you said, I think they were uh, Judaistic. Now, Christ did mention to the woman that they don't believe in going to the temple. They believe Christ's presence was at a certain mountain where they were located there, and uh, but I, I do look at, at Simon, and it, and it appears as though a great portion of the population there uh, considered him to be uh, of God or of a God, and uh, he was widely, it says he was widely regarded as a, a spiritual leader uh, and a person of uh, prominence within Samaria, so uh, that tells me that a, a vast portion of Samaria uh, did indeed reject Judaism and the Ju the, Judi the Judaizers that were left had disagreement as to where to worship God and I assume that had uh, uh, wide consequences in other ways and thirdly uh, again uh, only those born through the female line could, would be considered genetically Jewish so that would probably be about half the population and then diluted down from that. So I don't. I think they were widely regarded as outside of Judaism by the Jews, and that's why I said it was a first step towards the Gentiles. Okay. Well, I understand all those points. I was just wasn't sure if you had a theory on uh, uh, why there seems to be a different reaction to them. Um, hearing about Jesus compared to the reaction they had with Cornelius. Uh, so uh, let me go on to Ted now. Go ahead. All right, let me state the point we'll probably get to uh, last. I want to state it first, uh, and that is the, uh, the thing about the apostles uh, laying on of hands to, uh, to have people receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I, we do see instances after this. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, guys, correct me, and I, I didn't look at the verse, but uh, Paul, when he admonishes Timothy in uh, one of the, his epistles, uh, stir up the gift that is in thee by the laying on of my hands. Now, was that a spiritual gift? Maybe. 
Uh, does that mean uh, Timothy received the Holy Spirit by Paul's apostolic authority, by his laying on of hands? I don't know. We can look at that, but I wanted to hit on that first. But uh, I've got a lot of things i got to throw out there in this discussion you guys have had. I'd like to know, first of all, uh, what date this is. One thing, that I, I never had an old Schofield reference Bible. I, I went to church with some guys that did, and one of the things I liked about uh, this old Schofield reference Bible, and maybe it's in some other Bibles nowadays too, is that uh, in the book of Acts and in the Gospels and stuff, there was, there was you know, headers where they, before paragraphs and stuff would start in the Bible, uh, uh, dates calculated by Schofield or some historians and so forth, so I'd like to know about when Acts chapter 8 was. Uh, I wanted to throw that out there. And I'm going to uh, slightly disagree with Joe. Maybe this is a bit hair splitting, but I, I don't think Samaritans, uh, I don't think these Samaritans were, were considered Gentiles, especially by the apostles, because it says, um, you know, like you said, Luke, there was no arguing uh, when they heard about this, that one of the one of the disciples, Philip, went to, to go to the Samaritans, I don't think they considered them Gentiles at all. Because Acts 15, as you point out, Luke, we see a different scenario. They reacted, responded uh, negatively to Peter coming back after going to Cornelius. So um, it says in verse 14, Peter and John went up to them, went unto them. So I don't think they would be going unto Gentiles. I think they were going unto uh, the. I think. Let me just say this. I think the Samaritans are a special breed of cat, as we would say down south. I think they're a different breed of cat. I don't think they're they're Orthodox Jews, so to speak, but I don't think they're Gentiles, certainly. Otherwise, I don't think Peter and John would have just gone right up to them. Now, were there Gentiles in that region? Sure. Absolutely. That's how you get mixed races. But uh, I think uh, they, they were they practiced Judaism, maybe a strange form of, of Judaism up there, that the practicing Samaritans. Uh, much like I view, like I, I had some dear friends back when I lived in Florida that were they were Greek Orthodox and they were Christians. I know some people might disagree with that, like saying, oh, a Catholic or a Greek Orthodox couldn't be a Christian. These these people were Christian believing folks that just kind of some strange practices within Greek Orthodoxy, and so. Um, you know, I don't believe technically these these Samaritans uh, were anything uh, were were truly truly Gentiles. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go away from that idea. So uh, and and the word Gentiles, I think I heard Luke. I heard think I heard you say that Gentiles means non-Jews. Well, yeah, Jews called non-Jews Gentiles, but in the Bible, uh, the literal meaning from my from what I've seen, maybe you guys can show me wrong. Is Gentiles just means the nations. In fact, some of the literal translations you look at of the Bible, instead of Gentiles, they just translated translated the nations. So that's all that means. Uh, so um, I don't know. I'm throwing a lot out there. So we're barely two verses into this. I'll let you, I'll throw it back to you guys. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a, a timeline here for you. Uh, the um, Okay, Acts um, through Acts eight thirteen. It's uh, that would be uh, thirty one A.D. And then Acts nine 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 chapter beginning of chapter nine is thirty four A.D. That's when Paul converts. So Paul conversion say is thirty four. We're at thirty one now, so we're three years before Paul's conversion. Um, but it says that Philip, um, so Philip takes gospel to Samaria, and that's the last reference. It doesn't stay here in this timeline I'm looking at, uh, this case about uh, Simon the sorcerer, but uh, it's, it's, it goes up to verse 13, so I'm assuming that verse 14 would probably be in the same time frame. Uh, I don't know if that makes any difference in your conclusion or not, but uh, okay, uh, I'm ready to go on, but unless... Uh, have we covered it all? Anything else needs to be said by anybody? Okay, let me go on then. Uh, let me see. They laid hands on them. Okay, verse 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostle hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered the money, saying, 
give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Verse 20, But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Uh, repent, therefore, in this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So that's uh, Peter's condemnation. I'll stop there at verse 30, 23. And let me get back to the first order. I made a mistake by asking Joe to speak first last time. So let's go. Uh, Ted, you go first, please. Well, wow, there's a lot there. And uh, just uh, I, I think what we see here is that, uh, as we stated yesterday, uh, uh, somebody, I believe Simon, back up there uh, in verse 12, looks like to me he became a believer, uh, but yet uh, got carnal, got selfish motives, um, and wanted to, he had always had this power before of, uh, you know, amazing the people, of just awing the people, you know, just bringing them awe and uh, amazing them and astonishing them. And I think when he saw the uh, apostles uh, doling out the gift of the Holy Spirit by laying hands on people, he thought, wow, that's really uh, really a, a spectacle, you know. And uh, I think he just, uh, his flesh got the best of him. And he says, wow, I'd like to, you know, pay to, you know, pay for as an apprentice to learn how to do this or, or pay to be able to get this power from, from these apostles who... Uh, are in charge of this. They're in charge of giving out the Holy Spirit. So even if I have to pay for this power to have this amazing spectacle and this crowd grabbing awe, uh, you know, he was so carnal, I think that he just says, I'm willing to pay for it. And he he becomes so uh, addicted to people's approval and, and uh, crowd pleasing that I, I think that's why I did this. But I do think he was a believer, even though Peter had to sharply rebuke him. We'll get into that. Back to you. All right. This is a very interesting portion of the scriptures, uh, Brother Joe. Yeah, I, I think uh, we touched on this yesterday. Uh, I think the overwhelming uh, opinion of those that I've known of in the past uh, claim that Simon was not a, a, a true believer, but rather a, uh, a seeker of power and uh, believed that Christ uh, could give him that power, the Holy Spirit could give him that power. Uh, I, after, and, I, and I would always, <clears throat> because of these verses here, fell into that line of thinking. Now, uh, you and Ted kind of changed my mind yesterday on this issue, and I, I guess he must have been a believer because salvation is believing. And, and it does say he believed and was baptized. So uh, all I can say is uh, it just shows how messed up you can be as a believer. And, uh, uh, and I assume when he says pray that you can be forgiven, that you might be forgiven, I assume that means from the consequences uh, in this life rather than the next. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, well, yeah, we did discuss whether we thought that he, when he believed and was baptized, that if he was uh, a believer, a saved believer, uh, and we, we talked quite a bit about that yesterday, so we don't need to rehash it again, but um, it's interesting, I, I, I'm sure that Simon, he must not have the Holy Spirit either, none of these people in this area had received the Holy Spirit, and uh, uh, the, I think the most important thing about, that we're discussing in this whole section so far, and maybe as we continue here, is that um, we, we should not take this um, event of they don't have the Holy Spirit even though they believed. They lay on the hands 
and that now they receive the Holy Spirit. We should not take this and uh, as say uh, some Pentecostals uh, might take it and, and, and conclude that there's a doctrine that you don't receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, you've got to receive it later. Uh, by laying on of hands, and, and it's very common with Pentecostals that they think that uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not as I would define it. I believe the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens at the instant you believe on Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters you. And, and then it also says the Holy Spirit were indwelt, so that means it continues living in us. And then it also says we're sealed. That means that he ne will never leave us. This is all a simultaneous uh, thing that happens at the moment we believe. Uh, and yet the Pentecostals think that you believe and you don't receive the Holy Spirit until the point comes where you, you uh, speak in tongues. That's, that's the sign that you have received the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe that the... Uh, the, the the thing about speaking in tongues and the uh, uh, and the thing that uh, uh, the term uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, this is a different thing. It's it's uh, it, it's like right now we're doing a work. It doesn't seem like work because we're just really enjoying it and it's not laborious, but it's, it would be considered a, a, a Christian work. Uh, we're trying to teach and explain the scriptures for everybody's benefit, even though we don't understand it perfectly ourselves. We're learning and t trying to teach at the same time, and so. But it is a, a work, and to give us the power to do the works, it's uh, it's always a good idea. Lord, give us the power. That's like give us the spirit, strengthen us spiritually, so that we can do good works. That is to me the the right idea about. The filling of the spirit. Uh, it's the, the purpose was so that we are able, to, you know, pow, empowered to to do these works. Um, so the Pentecostals could take this portion of scriptures and see, see, you're not a Christian unless you speak in tongues and, and uh, lay on of hands, and and this is that that's when you receive the spirit. That's what's necessary. But the problem is we're taking. Uh, and ex this single example, now Ted, you said that there may be another case that we could cite that so it happens uh, again, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's correct until we get, get there. But uh, you don't take a single case like this and, and make it a doctrine when you have a uh, hundred other examples of saying people got saved by believing and there's no further um, um, uh, further things that are included. Like they believed and then they got baptized and then they spoke in tongues and they're baptized with the Spirit. If, if that was the truth, if that was the truth for everyone, then that would have to be explained every single time someone got saved. And it says, yes, they believed and they were saved. So um, um, I don't remember where we were or what we were talking about, but let me see if you have any thoughts on my, my response there. Ted first. Hey, did you notice that when I said Ted first, it's similar to Ted Ford, Ted Ford? Yeah, about that. Well, uh, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you said. Um, uh, this, this definitely, and, and you can see, I, you know, you can see why the Pentecostals and the Charismatics, some, some, some of them, would uh, would get the idea that uh, the Holy Spirit comes only by the laying out of hands, because that seemed to be the apostolic uh, pattern. Uh, may, maybe not pattern, but we do see this here in, in a couple of places. Um, and uh, I think it's always a good idea to read through. That's why I was asking about the dates. How early was that? It's interesting to note that you said this was like AD 31. Uh, wow. I mean, this is right after, I mean, Christ was crucified in AD 30. Is that right? I mean, so this was early on. You know, these are these are events that are happening in succession after Pentecost in the, in the days, weeks, and even months to follow. This is not years and years. Uh, this is the apostles getting to work right after uh, right after Pentecost, correct? Uh, well, let me, let me say something real quick before we go on to Joe, because I'm afraid the audience could think that we're either all ignorant or crazy or something when we talk about <laughs> Christ's death, burial, and resurrection being 
we, most people would say it was AD 33. Maybe it was, but, but ma many people have concluded, experts on the calendar, that there, if you adjust the calendar for the Jewish calendar, that um, Christ was born in uh, you know, uh, 3 AD, I mean 3 BC, and uh, died in 30 AD rather than, so that, that, that's, and that's what this uh, timeline here is based upon, the, the, the using the date that 30 AD is his death, burial, and resurrection. So that would mean that one year afterwards, these, these events have, have happened. So if you're saying, well, what do you mean? If this is one year after, shouldn't it be 34 AD? So just so people understand that, uh, um, and if you want to say that Jesus was crucified in 33 AD and this event with Simon happened in 34 AD, that's fine too. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me which way you look at that calendar, but it was a year later is the important thing that we, we want to get out of this. Brother Joe? Yeah, people just need to remember that the Jewish calendar is based on a 360-day year, and so uh, it adds up. Uh, regarding what we were talking about earlier, um, I, I just uh, uh, have to find myself in agreement. Uh, I, I really don't have anything uh, more to add, uh, primarily because I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> Back to you, Luke. Yeah, okay. All right. I'm, I'm sure that I was so thorough anyway that, that nothing else could be added anyway, right? Uh, I didn't hear any amens, but... All right, let me see. Where are we now? Uh, verse, uh, uh, he lectured, I repent. Okay, verse 24. So Simon Peter uh, just gave him a reprimand to, to Simon the sorcerer. And now it says, and when the verse says, then answered Simon, we got to understand that this is, there's two Simons here talking, Simon Peter and Simon the Sorcerer. So this is Simon the Sorcerer answered and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Okay, let's stop there. Just those two verses, 24 and 25. Brother Ted? Well, I don't think there's much to, much to add to it other than, uh, you know, what the text says, but Simon's definitely in fear here. Uh, he certainly, I believe, recognizes the apostle's authority, and uh, after he's reprimanded, that was a good word he used there, uh, pray that none of these things uh, which you have said, which you've declared, it's spoken, uh, come upon me. So, uh, you know, talking about him being in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity, he, he didn't want to stay in that condition. Uh, so this kind of actually it just came to my mind. Maybe it makes me even be more affirming of the position that uh, he was indeed a believer and, uh, and cared about these things, that these things concerned him because, uh, uh, because he, he truly was a saved guy and he didn't want to remain... Uh, being carnal and uh, in the bond of iniquity and in, in the gall of bitterness. That's a pretty uh, sad state to be in. So uh, anyways, that's all I have. Back to you. Yeah, that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty caustic uh, uh, reprimand that uh, Peter gave him. And uh, so that's how he reacted to it. I, I certainly hope that you guys never give me that kind of reprimand. If necessary, be a little nicer in your reprimand to me, okay? <laughs> Brother, Brother Joe, the, the, these two verses, really, it's the first verse that we're really are interested in. So it, this is uh, Simon the Sorcerer's reaction to Peter. What, what do you say, Brother Joe? Well, I, I saved my really, really bad rebukes for you, Lucas, to when I'm muted, so you don't need to worry. Uh, but, you know, this shows me two things. It, it shows me, number one, that uh, it does reinforce... Uh, what you and Ted had uh, suggested about him being a believer. You're not going to be afraid of a God you don't believe in or uh, in a Christ that you don't believe in. And number two, it shows that he had a very poor grasp of his faith uh, because he's asking them to pray on his behalf 
uh, you know, very, very Catholic of him uh, prior to the Catholic Church. And, uh, and he, was, he was seeking their power. You know, he's, he's uh, taken in by the power of all this, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he, he's, rather than seeking God himself, uh, he has, you know, he petitions these guys to on his behalf. And uh, what's terribly obvious by its absence is their agreement to do so. Back to you, Luke. Was there, uh, I, I didn't understand the last phrase you said. It was obvious of what? That they're, they're... They, they, didn't, they didn't agree to do that. I mean, they, they didn't say, we'll pray for you or, uh, uh, you know, you need to pray for yourself. Or they didn't. They didn't have any response. They basically just walked away, and so uh, he was left hanging, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, it's probably safe to assume they did not um, say say more. But then also, we we know oftentimes that more was said, but it's just not written down. We don't necessarily get everything. Every. Yeah, that's the that's the. Problem uh, is that uh, there's so much more that, that is we don't find in the scriptures that we, if we knew it all, then it certainly would be uh, filling a lot of these uh, answer a lot of these questions that we have. Uh, I'll read more than uh, verse uh, verse 25. Uh, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So they returned to Jerusalem, but preached to the Samaritans. 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, to, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. Uh, okay, I, I guess verses... 24 and 25 um, at 6, we don't need to stop at that point and, and comment. I'll, I'll include the whole thing with the eunuch here. Uh, verse 27, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, uh, a, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Uh, was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah, the prophet. Let's stop there, verse 28. So, Brother Ted? Well, I don't, I don't know if there's a lot to add either, other than uh, uh, Philip, you know, obviously uh, being dedicated and surrendered to the Lord's will. Uh, as soon as the Lord spoke to him, he sure didn't take the uh, spirit of, uh, of Jonah, did he? <laughs> we didn't contend with the Lord. He said, uh, the Lord says, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. You know, didn't sound like a fun trip, but uh, Philip was willing to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, one of those things by God saying, I'm going to set up a divine appointment. There's somebody there that's uh, ready to receive, so we'll, uh, I'll let you go. But I think the, uh, the text is going to tell us all about that. Back to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have something I want to say, but I like go, Brother Joe go first. Go ahead. Well, uh, a couple of things uh, pop for me here. Uh, the first thing that pops is uh, Isaiah. Now, that is Isaiah, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Isaiah chapter 50-something relates to uh, the coming of Christ his life, and his crucifixion. Now, I don't know what part of Isaiah he was reading, but wouldn't it be interesting if he happened to be reading about the Lord's life and death uh, in that very book when Philip came to him? And the second thing that pops is that this is, I've never heard of her, Candace, Queen of Ethiopians, but I do remember that uh, Sheba, the Queen of the Ethiopians, Queen of Sheba, which is the Ethiopians, just like Isaiah is Isaiah, uh, were Jewish. They, 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 uh, they uh, Queen of Sheba and Solomon, four children. And if I'm not mistaken, 
uh, the nation of Ethiopia was largely Jewish, or of the of the Judeo ethic anyway, because of that that uh, 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 coming together of Solomon and Sheba. So uh, two things: he might have been reading about the life and death of Christ, <laughs> and he might be also a non-Gentile. Maybe we'll see as it goes on. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, well, this uh, subject came up recently also in, in another hangout. I think it might have been one of uh, Brother Bill's hangouts, and uh, um, I, we looked at it very carefully. I, I'm pretty sure that it was as we read on, we're going to see that this is Isaiah 53, and it is the portion of scriptures that talks about Jesus' suffering and death uh, on the cross, and so that's uh, that's. That's something that I think we can be certain about. Uh, a lot of other thoughts, though, about this. Um, um, as, as far as um, the, um, well, let me just start with the verses before I, um, um, he says that he was um, uh, a eunuch. Uh, I'm, not very many people were eunuchs. So why do people become eunuchs? Uh, well, in, in this case, uh, if he if he's, has great authorities, is charge of the treasury of the queen, it wasn't unusual in these kinds of um, uh, you know government systems where there's a king or queen and, and then someone in the treasury uh, they, that uh, they they become make them eunuchs or they use a eunuch for that purpose so that they're not tempted with uh, you know sexual uh, interests. And, and they, uh, there's a lot of reasons for it, but it wasn't that uncommon that they would have a eunuch in this kind of position. Uh, the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Uh, now, as far as them being uh, uh, Ethiopians being Jewish, uh, uh, to me it's important to, un to, to see this is a, a, a recurring theme that I, I, I keep bringing up over and over again because to me, one of the most important things that we need to get out of this study of Acts um, is that um, uh, the, the Gentiles are not included in any of this. Uh, you know, originally uh, some people thought that Pentecost, they were talking to the Gentiles. Well, no, they weren't. They were Jewish people from around the world. And, and then, and then uh, other examples of, uh, like the Samaritans, were they Gentiles? I don't think they were considered Gentiles and that because I'm basing it on their reaction. They were oh, accepting of the Samaritans preaching to them, whereas they were very irate that uh, Peter would preach to Gentiles. Uh, so, and, and the reason this is important to me uh, is, is because when, it is important we understand when the Gentiles were first preached to and who was the first apostle to the Gentiles. This is an argument I've had ongoing for years with the Paul Onlyus who elevate Paul and say that he was not only the only one that teaches us salvation, not Jesus, John, or Peter, but just Paul, and, and that Paul was uh, had a, this a special office for he was the, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. He was, but he wasn't the first and he wasn't the only. Peter was the first. We'll see that when we get to Cornelius. And then he wasn't the only because... After we get the end of all this, we'll see that all the apostles go all over the world preaching to Gentiles. But up to this point, uh, I would say that this eunuch here, a person could say, well, isn't this eunuch a Gentile? And I would say, well, no, because first of all, if he was a Gentile, uh, at this point, it, it was forbidden to even talk, associate with the Gentiles. It was forbidden, certainly, to tell the Gentiles about this. The church, when they reacted to... Peter doing it was, was a, a severe reprimand to Peter at first. Uh, how dare you do such a thing? So I'm sure that Philip would have never just risked preaching to Gentiles or associating with Gentiles at this point. I think this Ethiopian eunuch was a Jewish by faith. That's why he's reading Isaiah. He's studying the Jewish scriptures. Now, as far as uh, the Queen of Sheba being uh, Jewish, I question that because I remember that 
one of the problems with Solomon is that here he is, this wisest man in the world, but at the, the, the last years of his life, he got involved in all kinds of pagan religions, and some people think that Queen of Sheba and some of these others gave, influenced him in that way. So uh, I, I would question whether Queen of Sheba was, was Jewish, uh, but uh, the, uh, this, this Ethiopian unit, eunuch, uh, I think it's clear he's Jewish. He studied the Jewish scriptures. It is Isaiah. All right, uh, before I go on, any more thoughts from either of you on that? Okay, let me read further then. Uh, okay, I'm trying to figure where I was. Uh, okay, verse 28. So this eunuch was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah's, Isaiah's which is, uh, let me look at the Amplified. I'm sure it'll say that it was uh, Isaiah. Yeah, in the Amplified it says the reading of the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Um, verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, which is Isaiah, and said, Understandeth thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip, that he would come up and sit with him. All right, let's stop there. Brother Ted. Well, yeah, this is good. Um... Once again, we, if, there's, if there's nothing else we're seeing in this, in this study of Acts, it's really making me see, uh, uh, I mean, in this context, is, is the obedience of Philip. No questioning, uh, no doubting. And, uh, I mean, Philip, obviously, uh, you know, a grown man. And I just think it's funny, after verse 29, not only does he go down to Gaza, uh, you know, obediently to the Lord, which is a, kind of a desert place, it says, but then it's, uh, the Spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Look what Philip does. Here he is a grown man, and he runs. He ran, ran up to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. So <laughs> it's, just, it's just good to see exuberant uh, obedience from Philip. And uh, I like the fact that uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading Isaiah out loud. I mean, uh, you know, we're getting nowadays to a point to where we Christians – when we don't have the persecution yet like we have in some other places. But, uh, you know, this guy's reading it out loud, uh, you know, doesn't care who ca who hears him. Uh, and, uh, and the fact that Philip runs up to him, I think these are just uh, notable things. So back to you guys. Yeah, that running makes me think of John and Peter running to the tomb. I almost found that interesting that they were running. Uh, uh, Brother Joe? Yeah, uh I hadn't caught that. Or Ted, yeah, he was reading it out loud. And and keep in mind that this guy is a guy of, of great prominence from Ethiopia. He wasn't just uh, some slave. He was in charge of the treasury, and that's a pretty highfalutin position. I've got to imagine that he was not by himself. I've got to imagine that he was enjoined by servants around him. I'm just guessing because he was a man of great prominence, and he was in a chariot. And uh, that was a sign of uh, wealth and position back then, no doubt, uh, going through the Roman lands. And uh, I like what Ted said. He's reading it out loud. And uh, why would he be doing that? And he doesn't understand what he's reading, but yet he's reading it out loud. Uh, that's, a, that's, that, that's a ponderance for me, unless he was maybe reading it to his servants or something. Uh, and, you know, my memory, Luke, is, you know, I've always thought that uh, Philip was transported by a supernatural act when he, when he visited this unit. That's my memory. But reading the text, it looks like uh, that was a false memory, and I, I don't know if other people have shared that. It says he went, you know, it sounds like he just got up and walked to where the Lord told him to go and then ran up to the chariot when he was directed to, to talk to this Ethiopian. So I don't know if you guys had that uh, had that narrative in your memory also, but I certainly did. Uh, so uh, that's all my thoughts here. Back to you, Luke. 
All right. Well, I would say that your false memory was half false and half correct uh, because at the end of their conversation is when he gets transported or raptured off somewhere. And it's not in the beginning. So that that is coming in the next few verses, I expect. Uh, all right. So let me read further. Uh, verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, so this portion here is the quoting from Isaiah 53, so um, it, this is what I said was, uh, it was become clear to us uh, as we went forward. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb, before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet, of himself or of some other man? Uh, all right. We'll stop there, Brother Ted. Well, here we're getting to, uh, you know, this is one of the greatest passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. Uh, I've asked, uh, uh, I've asked Jews before. I remember asking one uh, Orthodox Jewish uh, young guy on the street corner of, uh, you know, in West Los Angeles one time. Just I had, I didn't have a but a moment to witness to him before the light turned red, and he's on the side of the corner. I said, "Sir." Read Isaiah 53, and he just nodded his head like, okay, He's probably a young guy, maybe no more than 18, 19 years old. And uh, this this truly is revealing. I mean, this can only be about one person, and uh, Jews, Orthodox or not, have a hard time with this because this is so, so fitting uh, of exactly what happened to Christ and, uh, you know, hundreds of years later. Uh, so... And, and Philip's going to tell him exactly who it pertains to. Uh, at the end of verse 35, began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So uh, throw it back to you guys. All right, brother John. Yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, the 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 speaking Philip did was so poetic uh, that it was almost, you know, we know he was talking about Christ and he was quoting Isaiah. Uh, but it was very, very poetic in his speech. Uh, I guess quoting Isaiah, uh, it was. It would have been hard to understand, uh, being, you know, back there at the time, I suppose. And uh, it is kind of a mystery that needs revealed. And I, I, I don't think you saw your sidebar. You know, you were saying that Cornelius was the first Gentiles to be presented the gospel, and I put up there that he came to Jerusalem to to worship. So that says that he was of the Jewish faith, Luke, just to reinforce the point you were making. Back to you. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, again, you know, some people might think that, um, why does he keep on bringing this up over and over again? But to me, it's, it's so important to people to understand this because I've, I have to deal so much with the, uh, the Paul Onlyus, more commonly called hyperdispensationists, their teaching is can be very harmful because uh, what offends me about it really is that even though they are equally saved as we are, uh, uh, I don't like the fact that, it, that their teaching really diminishes Jesus, John, and Peter. You know, because you, you can't even get saved from reading the words of Jesus, John, or Peter. So, according to them, so uh, that's why I've taken such a strong stand against it. Um, so, the. Uh, now, uh, this Isaiah 53, uh, Isaiah, he was a prophet that lived uh, approximately 700 years before Jesus. And Isaiah 53 is, uh, if you read the entire thing and then match that up with the New Testament account of Jesus', uh, you know, his, his passion, his suffering and death, then uh, it matches up. And so... Um, we, we believe that this is a 700-year 
prophecy of events 700 years in the future that are very clear and specific detailed prophecy about the suffering Messiah. Uh, I remember years ago I was I think I was in Seattle, uh, Joe, uh, uh, visiting, and uh, we went to a museum, and they had, I think they had the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, on display, so we were excited to go to see that, and I, I got a chance to read Isaiah 53 in the Dead Sea Scroll, and then next to it, they had an explanation of it, and the explanation was the Jewish explanation, and it was it was so disappointing and sad to me. They they interpreted it that this was not a person, but this was the nation of Israel. I don't know. It just didn't make any sense. But um, clearly, the scriptures here, Philip is telling him this this uh, there's a prophecy, and he's going to tell him who who it is. It's Jesus. Uh, uh, there's another one that's similar to this too that I really love for that serves the same kind of purpose. It's a, it's a, by David uh, written about a thousand years before Jesus, and that's uh, Psalm 22, and it also goes into great detail about this suffering Messiah. Um, so the, these prophecies are, are these are some of the things that gives us as as Christians so much confidence that our faith in the Bible can be trusted. Um, let me read read on. So he asked him, he says, who is this written about? Is he writing about himself or some other man? Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? <laughs> and Philip and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Brother Ted? Yep, well, the, there's a couple of things about that that I noticed right off, and that uh, uh, verse 35, uh, the last part there, where, you know, well, it says where, started, where Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture, that Old Testament scripture from Isaiah, and preached unto him Jesus. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, Look, look at just what's written uh, in there and read between the lines. He preached unto him Jesus. I know Paul in the Colossians says, you know, we, him we proclaim. We proclaim him, you know, who's the head of all principality and authority. Uh, in the writer of Hebrews, uh, we're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All of these early disciples, apostles, and, you know, the Old Testament writers foretold, this is the one to look to. Jesus, he, Philip preached unto him Jesus. I think it's 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 key that we keep our focus on him as uh, you know in our personal witnessing. This is obviously a one-on-one -on -one thing uh, where Philip is doing this, and I, I love that he preached unto him Jesus. And just like uh, just like Paul said, we proclaim him. Him we proclaim. Uh, they went on their way, uh, and uh, oh, another thing about that is. Uh, about just preaching Jesus is, you know, Philip used the Old Testament, and I think we should too. And getting back to your uh, your uh, your stance against the Paul onlyus, uh, Luke, uh, you know, you don't have to use just Paul, just the epistles of Paul. I mean, he, this Philip used the Old Testament. You talked about the uh, the scripture in Psalm 22. You know, I think is the one you're referring to. Uh, another passage that's fittingly hundreds of years before Christ was crucified, and it says, "They have pierced my hands and my feet. Uh, my throat is dry. My tongue is dried up like a like a pot, potsherd or something like that." It says, "Dogs encompass my feet. Gentile Gentile dogs were at the foot of the cross. All that hundreds of years. I mean, the the uh, the execution of crucifixion hadn't even happened back when David wrote. Uh, hasn't hadn't even been invented yet. Let me put it that way." Uh, 
Uh, from my understanding and from what I've read from historians, uh, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet as a means of execution when David wrote that hundreds of years before Christ's crucifixion. So I think we go all through the Bible to preach unto people Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to say this. Uh, we're going to get down into uh, verse uh, 37 and 38 that, that you read. Now, if somebody's reading from an NIV or a New American Standard, uh, some of these Bibles, I think the ESV has it, but I, I haven't looked for sure. But basically, uh, you know, this we're going to have to throw a little bit, I don't know if you want to get into this, Luke, but manuscript evidence and the uh, textual arguments for certain manuscript families, there's basically two. There's the majority text, and there's the minority text, which is really two. The minority text is Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. We know where that came from. So, and they don't have this verse in there that says this part that says, "If thou believe with, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest." Uh, and he answered and said, "I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God." That that part of the passage is omitted, and you would understand why a Catholic manuscript would not have, "If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest," because why? Because they baptize infants. Uh, this is why, in some ways, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a stickler on on what manuscript family. Uh, you know, you read from in certain texts because I'm glad you're a KJV firster because the KJV, the New King James, Young's Little Translation, uh, Geneva, and that's all what I call the right manuscript family. <laughs> they come from the majority text or the Texas Receptus, what other people call it. So uh, I want to throw that out there because this is an important verse. Believers are supposed to be baptized. People who believe in Christ with all their heart, infants can't do that. All right, a lot of good points. I want to respond, but it's Joe's turn. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, uh, what comes to my mind is uh, what Ted said is absolutely correct. I mean, now, I didn't know some of the Spanish words he's throwing around out there, but uh, it, the points are obviously correct. And uh, and so, yeah, that that is very important, and it, it does explain why uh, some translations have it shown differently. I, I, I'm going to speak to the motivation of Philip. Now, I, I think he, you just remember, we were just at Simon just before this, and it said Simon was believed and, bat, and then was baptized. And then he's going all goofy, and Philip had to have been, oh man, and the apostles are like, oh really, Simon, you know, and now he's, the next person that he's witnessing to is this Ethiopian. And I think he's going, I don't want another Simon here. Now, if you believe with all your heart, yeah, I think he was just emphasizing his experience uh, with Simon. That's, that's my opinion. Back to you, Luke. Uh, all right. It took me a second because I was looking up something as you're talking about it. Um, Hmm, trying to find right. I have so many things minimized here right now. Okay, uh, let me just go through this uh, the scriptures we were talking about because you guys said things I want to respond to, but I think I'll just go through the scriptures. And maybe I'll remember everything. Uh, uh, so he says, uh, and they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And so, of course, one of the things that uh, we, we, we draw a, a, a serious, a, 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 a distinction that is so serious that I would call it a damnable heresy. It's not just you're, you're wrong about a, a doctrine. Uh, that's, that's not so important, but th this doctrine is so important that it's damnable. It's the difference between life and death, heaven and hell, and that is, what do you have to do to be saved? Do you have to get wet or not? And and uh, there are there are sects of uh, Christians, or let's say people who have identified themselves as Christians, and they believe that believing on Jesus is not enough. You're not saved unless you get wet. You've got to get baptized. Uh, water baptized, I should say. 
And uh, so this verse here, we can see that um, he believed, and then he gets baptized. Uh, and that's that. You don't. You you as Brother Ted said, the uh, the idea of of uh, being baptized without believing, like an infant baptism, um, it's it, it may be comforting to a, a parents to do that with their children, uh, uh, but uh, and I don't want to get sidetracked into uh, the question of uh, you know uh, uh, age of accountability and what happens to infants that die. Anyway, that's that's a, that's a totally different kind of study we would have to do. But the point is, uh, baptizing an infant is not going to accomplish anything uh, spiritually for that infant. You have to be, be able to understand uh, in, in order to believe. If you, you can't believe in Jesus unless you understand ba the basics about who you are, who he is, and, and why you need him, and, and you just make a decision to trust him. Infants are not able to do that. So here we have someone believing and then being baptized. Now, the, the other point of view is the exact opposite. And again, these are the Paul Onlyists, the hyper dispensationalists. They take the exact opposite approach and say, people tell you you got to get water baptized to be saved, and that's wrong. Well, I agree with that. You don't have to ever get water baptized. I, it's highly recommended. You should do it, but it's not required for salvation. But then the hyper dispensationalists will say, in fact, you better not get wet. If you get wet, then you're not going to be saved because your your faith is not in Jesus. Your faith is in the baptism, and that would be true if if a person uh, was thinking that they had to get baptized in order to get saved, uh, because then their faith is in this religious ritual work rather than their faith being in the Savior. But what they don't understand is that as Philip and the eunuch in this situation, he says, is it forbidden? I think that's the word he actually uses there, if I'm remembering it right. He says, oh, yes, he says, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Let me see how that verse 36 is in the Amplified. Amplified, verse 36. Look, water. What forbids me from being baptized? So uh, uh, the, you're not for, not, he's not forbidden from being baptized. Of course, uh, Paul Onius would say, well, Paul hasn't even come along. These people are not even Christians yet. You, they're, uh, they're under a different dispensation, and uh, it's, you know, that's how they answer it. They just, it's a really simple and easier way to have your theology is that all the problems in the, in the, in the scriptures you find, you can say, well, that doesn't even apply to us. Just say with Paul, it, I, I can answer all the problem texts in the Bible that way, Matthew and James and this and everything else. Uh, but it, it's an easy way out, and, and it's not, but it's not the truth. So here, but the, the other question about this portion here is this question of believing with all thine heart. Now I looked up an earlier verse because there's another verse that talks about the heart. Let me see, it's uh, Romans 10.9. Uh, I never did it exactly right, so I'm going to read it. It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So this is uh, another example of this word heart being used. And uh, it's, what does it mean to believe in your heart? Uh, we, we've talked about this in the past in other hangouts, but not everybody has seen those. I think so it, it makes sense to cover this again. And that is that, you know, the heart is... It, t technically, the heart is an organ. It's it's a material organ, and it, it performs a, a function like a pump pumping the blood. It has nothing to do. The heart that really doesn't have anything to do with believing or not. But there's also another expression, um, and, and the word is 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 your is it heartfelt? And 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 that's that's the way that we should take this. Is it heartfelt? Is it sincere? Do or do you really believe? Okay, 
so it's just a question of he's saying if you're sincere, then you're not forbidden. You know, as long as you truly believe. And uh, but it, it but it's not a degree of belief. Like you got to believe on a scale and uh, of one to ten, and you got to be at least be a seven point five. Otherwise, you're not believing in your heart. You know, and that's the way the Lordship Salvationist would 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 teach something like this, uh, saying that some people, they believe, but you can tell because their life doesn't change enough afterwards uh, to satisfy the, the Lordship salvation, because they want to judge everybody's salvation by their changed lives. And so they say, well, their life didn't change enough. They didn't believe with their heart. It wasn't. Uh, they, they believed in their mind, but not in their heart. But believing your mind is the same thing as just believing. It's just you believe something. Now the question is, is it heartfelt? Well, that just means if you sincerely believe. So that's the other important thing that we need to get out of this. Uh, I, I think I've covered a lot of bases there, but let me ask each if you want to re respond to any of that. Ted. Well, bro, I think you covered it all, and uh, I like that. Uh... Lordship salvation scowl you threw out there. Well, you didn't believe enough with all your heart. You had the you had the curl of the lip in there. That was a good Pharisaical scowl, bro. All right, thanks, brother Joe. Yeah, I I, I stand by the fact that I think uh, uh, that it has those meanings for us today. Uh, I think back then it was just Peter uh, expressing his frustration with just having dealt with uh, uh, Simon, and uh, so. Uh, I think he doubted Simon's sincerity, but uh, who knows? Uh, I think it's important to remember that you know the Jewish baptism. It, it's not a Christian uh, 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 ritual. It, it originated in, in Judaism, and it was for consecration of the rabbis prior to uh, uh, having the blood sprinkled on them. Now, if you stop and think about it, that's works before being forgiven and so that kind of sums up uh, their their whole you know law uh, belief system you know they went and cleansed themselves prior to being sprinkled by the blood after a sacrifice and uh, with Christianity of course it's just the opposite and, and we've ad admit they largely adopted this uh, ritual to show our cleansing afterwards back to you Luke uh, let me let me say one thing more before we we go on. I just remember that something Ted said about the the manuscripts and, and this verse being omitted. And I I was looking at I have this parallel the KJV and next to it I have my Amplified translation. And then there's footnotes. And I look down to the footnotes for verse 37. It says early manuscripts do not contain this verse, verse 37. Uh, you know I never noticed that. I wasn't aware of that before. But there, there are quite a few important verses that are are not in uh, m most of the modern translations that are using that set of manuscripts, um, and that's why the KJV is so important. It, it has verses that you won't find in modern translations. Now, the other side, the people who hold on the other side of this position, believe in this. Uh, the the majority manuscripts. There, there's a uh, I mean the older manuscripts. There's a difference. The older manuscripts are the ones that they trust. They say they're older, so they must be better. They must be correct. Uh, and then there's another one side called the majority. So the majority are saying we have this verse, but the older ones don't. Uh, Dr. Ruckman, who's a, one of the king, probably the king of the KJV only is, um, he would he he cited that uh, the these um, Older manuscripts, though, um, logic would tell you that the older would be better because the the argument would be, well, if it's not in the older one, it must have been added later in the in the in the newer ones. But um, uh, he he said the older ones were like pristine because they they were uh, they were just like put away because they said, well, we we can't we can't use that; it's not right. So they are in pristine condition, and where the the majority texts are all par, uh, you know crumpled and, and and little pieces, bits and pieces here and there, they have to be assembled, and you know it was definitely used because these were the ones. This was the line of uh, kind of the genealogical line of scripture that, that we uh, 
commonly we, well, a lot of people say the Texas Receptus, but the KJV is partly Texas Receptus, if not entirely. But that that line, genealogical line of, of manuscripts, are that's the majority, and uh, that's the ones that we uh, believe in, even though they're not the oldest. And so there's other verses like, like for example, the Trinity verse is not in the newer ones, but it's in the KJV, and I, I think it's. I think it's 1 Timothy 3.16, if I remember right, it says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It's the single verse in the Bible that, that best explains in a single verse the concept of a trinity. Uh, and yet that doesn't even appear in your modern translation. So that's why uh, I'm the KJV first, just because I want to have those verses. I think it's important to have those. But uh, I don't take it to the point where I'm afraid to look at other translations because sometimes it can be helpful uh, helpful to understand things. Um, all right, anything else before I go on from either of you? Okay, let's go to, I think we got, uh, well, let me ask you about the time schedule here. Um, um, how is everybody feeling? Do we want to finish this up at the end of this chapter, the next two verses, uh, or should we uh, begin with the next chapter and try to go with 30 more minutes? So how are you guys feeling? I'm easy either way, whatever y'all want to do. Uh, ditto, Luke. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll, go. we'll go on then. Uh, we'll, uh, you guys, um, while you're talking about this next verse, I'm going to ask my wife real quick, see what she's done for dinner, if it's ready, or if it's, uh, I'll let her know I'd like to go further. So let me get her permission, because remember that scripture about wives? A happy wife is a happy life. What is that? That's that's Luke 1.1, 1, 1, isn't it? Or my Luke 1.1. 1, 1. Um, all right, so the, now we're on verse... Uh, verse 39 and 40, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Uh, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, uh, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. There's your rapturing away of, of Philip that you mentioned, Brother Joe. Okay, uh, Brother Ted, your thoughts? Well, I don't think you covered uh, verse 38, Brother. Did you want to, did I Did I imagine that you skipped verse 38 uh, or not? Um, let me look at it. I, I thought I did. Let me see. I thought I mentioned it. I, I thought we. I read it, yeah, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. Yeah, I did. I read it, and nobody chose to say anything about it, I guess, I mean, if specifically, but we did talk about him being baptized. So, yeah, you must have uh, zoned out or something when I read that. Okay. I probably Do you want to say anything about it before we go on? Why don't you just include 38, 39, and 40 if you want to comment on all of it? Go ahead. Okay. I, I know we were getting into some other stuff regarding... What you know? The, what manuscript said what? I didn't know we got all the way to verse 38 because I didn't hear anybody comment on it so far. Uh, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water. Uh, and that's I think this is a verse for uh, confirmation that uh, uh, baptism certainly looks like uh, it's immersion. Uh, uh, you know, I know the word can mean to dip or to plunge in the Greek, I guess, from what from what scholars say. I don't know. I'll leave that to the scholars. Uh, but it certainly uh, certainly looks like if they go down into the water that uh, it would be uh, immersion. I know that other people say it might have been just, you know, getting down there and pouring on, you know, with his hands. I don't know. It, it seems like they're, they're both going down into the water. Uh, taking the trouble to do that, it was it was by immersion. I just wonder what you guys' thoughts are on that. I'm not, I don't, I'm not someone that says it has to be or it wasn't a real baptism. But uh, you know, what are you guys' thoughts? I, I, while while we were uh, discussing the last set of verses, I ran over to Yahoo and brought up the uh, the Jewish uh, traditions uh, page, 
and looked up baptism because I was confused as to how the Jewish uh, religion uh, saw baptism. Now, I know they went out and were baptized by John the Baptist, but what did that signify? So I was just curious, and I ran over to Yahoo and looked it up. And according to the Jewish dictionary, uh, baptism was total immersion, and it was primarily practiced by the rabbis, like I said, prior to having the blood sprinkled on them, uh, signifying good works before forgiveness. And so it was a consecration, and it was uh, uh, typically a full immersion. So that's how the Jewish tradition viewed baptism. And now we're translating that over to after Christ. They want to hang on to the rituals, uh, but they want to show total consecration, but they want to do it after the forgiveness. And so it's just polar opposite to the Jewish tradition, which was before the, the forgiveness. And uh, I find that to be fascinating. Back to you, Ted. Um, well, I don't. I don't care uh, if I was going to baptize someone, and and, and when I got baptized, it, it was in a swimming pool, and it was immersion, and because th that's the way that you get a picture of what it represents. It's a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and your own death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, uh, and so uh, that's the way. Uh, I would do it, but which way, is there one way that's required? Well, no, because baptism isn't even required. Oh, no! Brother Luke is the child of the devil saying such a thing. Uh, you know, I, I recommend if if, if, you know, if if I let someone to Jesus, I'm going to tell them uh, you should get water baptized so that, you know, so that all your friends and family can know it's a great opportunity for you to publicly proclaim, look, I put my faith in Jesus, and this is what the baptism represents. So it's for their benefit. It's not for the baptizee or the baptizor. It's for the audience. That's what the benefit of the baptism. Um, but um, uh, it, it's not really required. But it's interesting. You know, when I was doing all that study of early church history, I came across this thing called, uh, title. I think the title is On Heresies is the title of the book. It's an ancient book by Irenaeus written in the, uh, I think it was the second, second century, on heresies. I was so interested in that. <laughs> and the heresy, we're all about formulas for baptism and the sacraments and all that, the intricacies of how to do all these things. And, and it, was, it was not the kind of writing on heresies that I would write, that what I would consider important in heresies. But that's, you can see right in the beginning of the second century, they started emphasizing formulas for baptism, the, uh, the communion, the Eucharist, all that stuff. The, 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 the teachings of Roman Catholicism came and took over right in the second century. It was started being, all these false things started being introduced. It wasn't, it didn't wait till Constantine in, in the fourth century and thereafter. Uh, but Irenaeus, he said about baptism, uh, that uh, there are various ways that are acceptable, but this is the best way. This is the way that we recommend that you get immersed, and and uh, primarily you you should try to get immersed in a river that's moving. That would be that's the best. And uh, then if you are if you're not able to get immersed, then you do want to get immersed in some kind of running water. In other words, uh, it should be like poured over your head so that it's running. Uh, that's uh, that's how they, that's how he said was uh, his part of his formula. Um, now, um, what about the other verses, uh, the 39 and 40, Brother Ted? Well, obviously it's a miraculous thing there that happens with, uh, with Philip getting caught away by the Spirit. I mean, I didn't know if we seen much like this since uh, Christ's ascension into heaven, you know, uh, you know, into the atmosphere, uh, or the same thing with Elijah being caught up into the atmosphere in the Old Testament. Uh, obviously a miraculous thing of God, and I wonder how the uh, uh, people that want to get doctrine from Acts say uh, that, uh, you know, after baptisms this should be, you know, <laughs> if not the norm, at least possible. Uh, 
we don't see this. We don't see things like this happening uh, after this uh, miraculous period. It's just a, it's an amazing time in church history. Back to you. All right, Brother Joe. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm curious, uh, Luke and Ted, is, is do after uh, the Book of Acts and into Paul's ministry is baptism uh, suggested or used after this to the Gentile nations? Because it is a, a Jewish uh, ritual that's Christianized or brought forward uh, into uh, uh, our traditions. Uh, but you know, if that's the case, you know, we and people are reluctant to get baptized. Just let them know they, that, you know, if they don't want to do that, we can do the circumcision first. Back to you guys. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I heard. Uh, a woman recently say she posed a question. She said, "What do you call that that uh, clump of tissue at the end of a, a man's penis?" And uh, she said, "The answer is a man." <laughs> in other words, in other words, she was talking about the other end of the, the penis. I thought that was funny. But Joe, what do you think? You're a good judge of humor. Uh, I, I was I was busy rebuking you with the mute on. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Let's uh, let me talk about these last two verses here. And when they were come out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, uh, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. So I think what happened here was. Um, I think it was John Luke Picard uh, uh, that uh, he beamed him up, beamed him across, and relocated him with that. Um, that what's that beam? The transporter beam, uh, or or else it could be maybe the Lord, you know, like transporting the rapture could be up, taken him up, or it could be taken over. And then, and uh, in this case, I think it's. He was just moved, relocated by the Holy Spirit. Now, was he intact as his body flew through the air? And he says he disappeared. It must not have been a real slow thing that, like Jesus' ascension, everybody could observe it. But this is like seemed like it's a blink of an eye. Is what I'm getting out of this. He just disappeared. So, uh, did he his whole body remain intact and zoom at light speed, and he just disappeared, or was was he molecularly disassembled? And then reassembled in another location. Who knows? Uh, but these are supernatural things that that God uh, is able to do. Uh, just as Jesus, in His resurrected body, uh, He would appear inside a room without opening a door and walking through it. Um, so He could. Um, I, uh, to me, he, he couldn't be remain whole and walk through the. They didn't see him walking through the wall. There's no rec no description of these uh, resurrection appearances of Jesus. He walked through the wall. It's just that he was there. So to me, I think that he was molecularly taken apart and just put back together inside the room. And um, now, an interesting thing all, is that. Uh, we're supposed to have the same kind of body. According to Paul, we're going to have the same kind of body that Jesus had after, after his resurrection, this, this glorified body. Uh, and and I, I believe, and I, I'm hopeful, that we have the same kind of uh, abilities with our body that Jesus had with his body in this glorified body, that we could just appear in different places. So right now, if, if I wanted to be up in Seattle, bing, I did, instantly I could appear in Seattle intact and be with Brother Joe right now. And then Brother Joe and I would be there talking to Ted. Of course, Ted could just materialize and join us in Seattle too if he wanted to. Then we could all be in the same place. It would be even better fellowship. Then I can get the hugs from you guys that I've always wanted. Uh, now, so that... Yeah, and the other example that we have, as you said, is uh, uh, Elijah. Now, didn't Elijah go up in a chariot, if I remember correctly? He, his chariot was, he was in the chariot and it went up. But, he, they, you know, people compare Elijah. I don't, I'm surprised most people are not 
ever referencing Philip in this example here as a rapture uh, event. Um, he he also wasn't taken up and away, but he was taken across, you know, to this other location. Uh, so these are kind of sim similar, maybe as as a as a resurrection or a rapture event. Uh, well, at the last verse, let me see what it says. Um, oh, but Philip was found in Azotus. I'm going to look at the amplified footnote here. It says, uh, um, Caesarea Martima, it was a coastal city, an artificial harbor built by Herod the Great. It was an important city both politically and militarily, and its harbor was the largest on the eastern Mediterranean coast. It was the capital of Judea and the official residence of the prefects and procurators appointed by Rome, Pontius Pilate, and Antonius Felix uh, would have been based here during their respective terms of office. I was hoping it was going to say the distance, how far he actually traveled, but it doesn't say there. Um, but in the Amplified, that verse is, uh, but Philip found, no, no, let me read the Amplified in 39 and 40. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip and carried him away to a different place. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the good news of salvation to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the Amplified uh, version of those last two verses. Um, all right, so... Uh, no reason why we can't carry on. Let me move to the next chapter. Okay, there we are. Okay. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now it's totally chain of scenery and people here. It says, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. Verses 1 and 2, Brother Ted. It's interesting that uh, the first two words of chapter 8 and chapter 9, uh, at least in the KJV, are and Saul. Some versions may say then Saul, but it's like, wow, you know, he's a highlight, you know, he's, he's a central figure starting there, something's about to happen with him, and then chapter 9, and Saul again, and this time, you know, he's breathing out uh, threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, and one chapter before, he was consenting unto uh, Stephen's death. So, wow, just, um, this guy's on a rampage. This guy's like a man possessed. He's, he's a man with a mission, and that's to destroy Christianity. And uh, we, we have some of those people around nowadays, don't we? Uh, sure. Uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And I'm agreeing with you. I think you said, Luke, last time uh, that... Uh, I don't think we have any anything that confer, says in Scripture that Saul, you know, actually killed Christians. I think he just gave authority to have them imprisoned and maybe, you know, put to death like he did with Stephen and consenting to his death that way. But I hear preachers say, oh, you know, uh, Paul used to be a guy that killed Christians. Well, I, I, he may be, have been consenting unto their death and their things like that, but he was a persecutor. But I don't think we, we see that he actually, there's nothing in Scripture that I see where he actually killed Christians, uh, you know, certainly had him had him beaten and so forth. He might have even participated in that. We don't know, but uh, uh, I think uh, his authority, you know, is the thing to look at here. He was he was he was bound and determined to do this, uh, bound and determined to bring Christians bound and uh, have them persecuted. So um, I'm sure we'll continue on with that. Back to you, brother. Yeah, I, I was thinking, 
the same kind of uh, thing flashing back to that earlier conversation about Paul and, and Stephen. And uh, I'll all say more about that after Joe talks. Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't, I, I agree with Ted. I, I don't think, uh, it, from what I've heard in the past, that the Jews had prisons. And there was uh, restitution and there was uh, a death. And outside of Jerusalem, especially, they had no authority to bring someone to death. And so they uh, uh, had to use the Roman government, lest they uh, break the rules of the Roman government, because they were under subjugation, remember. So uh, the, the stoning of Stephen may have even been outside of the bounds of what they were allowed to do. And, and secondly, uh, I, I went over to Yahoo, as I often do while, while uh, I'm listening to you guys, to look something up. And I went from Gaza to, uh, what's the name, I forget the name of the town, but I, I put it in the search engine, and it was 20 miles. So Philip was uh, transported a, a distance of 20 miles, just a curiosity thing. Uh, back to you. Okay. Uh, well, you know, Ted, when you were making your comment about uh, Paul killing people, I actually, as you began talking about it, I thought you were going to make a different conclusion. Uh, because this, to me, when we spoke about Paul holding the clothing of those who were stoning Peter and consenting to it, and, and Paul is known as the, he's, is he persecuted the church, and all, I don't remember all the descriptive words about it now, but this here is the first time, only time I can think of, well, actually I didn't, I didn't even think of this, but it just, that word slaughter is, is really significant because it, it's telling me that um, once Stephen was killed, as we said, the floodgates are open for the persecution, and the persecution did include death sentences, apparently. Now, did Paul, with his own hands, uh, stab someone, kill them in any way? Uh, uh, I doubt very much, just like a governor doesn't uh, kill someone, but he's, he's consenting to an execution, you know, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, uh, so it, it, there's more than just being punished uh, with but the beatings. We, we see several examples of Peter and John and the apostles being beaten by the Sanhedrin. Uh, and then when Stephen dies, now we're seeing that it's even more severe, even death. Uh, so this word slaughter here, uh, it convinces me that, uh, yeah, Paul did murder the church, not with his own hands, but he was in charge of it. So he, he is responsible. Uh, and Paul said that he laid waste to the church. I remember that. I, remember, I think that's the exact terminology. Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, I don't remember if there was something else I was going to say or not, but, that, but all right, let me, let me read on, uh, verse three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. <laughs> I don't know. I always laugh when I hear that saying here. So verse ending at verse 5, Brother, Brother Ted. Yeah, well, here, uh, here, uh, you know, the old saying, uh, you know, you're about to meet your maker. Uh, usually, all, always people, when they say that, they're referring to someone's death. But Paul literally is, is meeting his maker here. Uh, it's just, uh, and, you know, the road to Damascus experience uh, that Paul had here is one of the, one of the greatest and most turning, uh, dramatically turning points, I think, in, in, uh, in history, in Christian history at least, uh, along the way to Damascus, uh, suddenly it didn't just like it didn't just like say, well, the clouds started rolling away and you know the light got brighter in that region. You know, it says 
suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. This was obviously the glory of God, Christ's presence beaming down, probably laser beam quality, you know. And, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That tells me from what is going on up there, the threatenings and slaughter and the persecution of Christians around the, uh, that whole region, that whole uh, area of all of you know, Palestine, all the Middle East that was going on. Uh, Christ identifies with his believers as himself. I think we need to get this. Well, people, we, we, this is what we do. We get the impression that, well, I'm not important to God. I don't have a lot to offer. Uh, you know, I'm one of those second, third, fourth, 42nd uh, grade Christian way down on the totem pole. You know, our pastors and ministers and evangelists are important, but I'm nobody. Nonsense. It's, it's utter nonsense. It's, it's a lie from, from the devil. The thing is, Christ identifies his body, his believers, as himself. Why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting my body, the body of Christ? That's my believers. Uh we're members of his body. Yeah, for, for This is a glorious truth that we need to get as Christians. And, uh, you know, he says, Why persecutest thou me? And he says, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Paul had never persecuted Jesus Christ in person. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what region exactly. Oh, well, Paul's from Tarsus. I just answered my own question I was about to ask. So he wasn't in Jerusalem, looks like, probably around the crucifixion of Christ. He certainly heard of it, uh, of the goings on there. He says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the or the ox goads or the goads. Uh, I think from what I've learned, that's cactus, right? And people wore sandals in those days. Uh, how smart would it be go to, to go kick a, a cactus plant when you're wearing sandals? In other words, I think Christ is saying, you're only hurting yourself besides hurting my body. Uh, you know, it's not very smart. So back to you. All right, Brother Joe. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, the point Ted made can be uh, understated. That's a huge, huge point. We don't we don't hear Christ speak again in those terms until uh, the judgment of the uh, tribulation uh, population at the end of the tribulation when. He separates the sheep from the goats, or the believers from the unbelievers, and uh, and uh, condemns those who did not uh, serve him. You know, uh, he came to their door, but you you didn't give me food. I came to your door, but you didn't clothe me. And they said, "Well, when? When was this?" And Christ responds, "Well, when the least of mine." Uh, so yeah, this is a, a direct uh, correlation between the end of time and the beginning of the church. And uh, uh, so that, like I said, what Ted said can't be understated. A uh, very important point. Thank you, Louise. Okay. Uh, oh, I want to read it and comment as I'm reading here. Um, And he, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, I'm not seeing anything in these verses that we just read of a visible Jesus. Uh, we, we, I think we all believe that this was a resurrection appearance to Paul. Uh, and I'm not sure if it says here or anywhere uh, that, uh, anything that we can con concretely say say that. But here we have a voice, just like we have, and we have a light. It's kind of like uh, the, the baptism of Jesus when uh, you have the, the Father's voice. And also at the transfiguration, you have the voice of the Father speaking. So he's there and he's speaking, but there's no visible... Uh, picture of him uh, and he fell Paul fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him Saul Saul why persecutest thou me and brother Ted that's a good point um, he hasn't persecuted Jesus he hasn't physically harmed him in any any way he didn't uh, put any nails in his 
in his hands. And he, uh, so how can he be persecuting Jesus? Well, it's because he's persecuting the believers, which we call, the scriptures call, the body of Christ. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So Jesus is again saying, Paul is persecuting him, whereas he's, he's actually persecuting the believers of Jesus. And it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I want to read that portion in the Amplified here. Um, as he traveled, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, displaying the glory and majesty of Christ. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice from heaven saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting and oppressing me? And Saul said, who art who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Oh, I read a verse too far. Uh, that uh, kick against the pricks in verse 5 uh, is not mentioned there. So let me see in the footnotes if they leave that out too. No, it's just the way they translated They In their translation, they didn't mention. To me, kicking against the pricks is just stubbornly resisting the truth. It's, fut it's a picture of futility, kicking against the pricks. You're not going to succeed. <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, all you do is you're hurting yourself, but um, all right. Um, I, unless you anybody wants to respond to anything I just said there, um, I'd like for you to give your uh, your your summary and also any highlight points you want to mention before we close, so that we can finish here within the next eight minutes. Is that do I have my time right today, Joe? Because you remember how I messed up? Uh, you, you do indeed, Luke. You're, you're on the money this time. Okay, so uh, I want to finish here in seven minutes now. So you guys give your summary, and, and then I'll give a gospel message. Well, it's, all this is great stuff. I mean, the book of Acts is just all action and, uh, you know, nonstop. Uh, it's... You know, that's why I say there's a lot of drama there, but it, it's true drama. This is, uh, you know, reality is better than fiction, you know, for real drama. For, you know, then this is what happened. And um, these things are changing the course of human history right here. The things we're reading about are why we are, uh, you know, in our world as we know it today, where there is uh, at least a good percentage uh of, uh, of people on this earth that are professing Christ as Savior because the early testimony and the early persecution that spread the good news about Christ in Acts and we're just we're just touching the surface and now the arch enemy of the faith uh, meets his maker <laughs> getting saved and, and right away gets obedient toward him to, to him uh, so uh, great things uh, coming up too back to you all right, thank you. Brother Joe? Yeah, I echo what Ken said again. Uh, I think that we're now approaching the second most important event in the history of the church, uh, what most people would consider the second most, you know, the, the life of Christ and now the life of Paul. And so uh, this, is, this is pretty important stuff that we're entering. And I'll just leave it there because of time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, when we did this study recently, we uh, on the the book uh, "More Than a Carpenter" by Josh McDowell, and that was a wonderful experience for all of us. Uh, so, if you have, if you're watching this video and you're not familiar with that book, um, our, we went through that book just as we're going through the scriptures, but you know, very carefully, and it's a great book. Uh, giving a lot of our proofs and confidence why, why we can trust the Bible and trust our, trust, trust our faith in, in Christ. Uh, but some of the points made in that book was this bodily resurrection of Jesus, how it changed the apostles from cowards to bold preachers and martyrs. And another, of course, one of the main points was that uh, this conversion of Paul was such, it gives us such confidence that uh, our faith is true because we saw how the, the life of Paul changed, uh, going from 
someone who wanted to destroy the church to becoming uh, what many people believe is the, the greatest apostle, or the, is certainly the greatest uh, you know, uh, missionary and church planter and, and theologian as far as uh, writing about salvation. Only the Gospel of John equals Paul's writings in terms of teaching us how to be saved. Uh, so, uh, all right, well, we'll pick up uh, with verse 6 in ch chapter 9 uh, next time, maybe tomorrow if, if our schedules allow it. But let me end with a short message about salvation for everyone's benefit. Uh, I mean, you could study the book of Acts and all the books of the Bible and become an expert on the Bible and, and go to hell. Studying the Bible, reading the Bible doesn't save you. Even understanding the Bible doesn't save you, you know. But there is one thing in the Bible that you can learn that does save you, and that is what do you have to do to get saved? It tells you specifically, clearly, over and over and over again, more than a hundred times. It says all you got to do is believe on Jesus. You don't have to join a religion. You don't have to become a religious person. You don't have to follow a set of religious rules. Um, you don't have to make yourself acceptable to God and, and, and uh, so that you can go to heaven. None of those things are required, and in fact, none of those things, things will actually work. You, they, you cannot succeed in going to heaven through all your religious efforts, so just disregard that and, and, and give up on that. Instead, the Bible says the one thing that you are required to do, the only thing that does actually work in terms of successfully saving you, it is put your faith completely in Jesus. Don't put your faith in religion and personal merit. Uh, instead, put your faith in the one that can save you, Jesus Christ. Uh, now, he, the Bible says that he is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven and became a man. He became a man in order to die. And he did faithfully go to that cross, willingly. He suffered and died on the cross and paid for the sins of the whole world. So your sins and mine, everybody's sins are paid for because of what Jesus did for us. So now because he paid for our sins, now there's no longer a barrier separating man and from God. We can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did for us. But you can only have that relationship by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, so... Uh, he died on that cross, but on the third day, he, after being buried, he was raised bodily alive. And he, he, he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days, proving he was truly raised from the dead. And he said that this bodily resurrection would be the sign he offers us, the proof that he is God, he is the Savior, he is the sole source of life everlasting, and he, he is faithful to keep a promise to you. If you trust him, you're going to go to heaven. Just put your faith completely in him. No one else, nothing else. Just trust Jesus, and you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Not because of any good thing you've done, but because of the good things Jesus did for you and his faithfulness to keep his promise. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. All right, brothers, uh, thank you for participating again. And... Uh, Hopefully our schedule will work out. We can do some more of this tomorrow, okay? So uh, bless you all. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm going to give you another chance. I'll give you each a few seconds to say your goodbyes. Brother Joe? Oh, I had nothing to say. I thought we were uh, off air all of a my, my thing. Oh, all, all right. Brother Ted, any last words? No, we're all good. Thank you, brother. Okay, thank you. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.